When John Neinstead resigned as Archbishop, he left the diocese in bankruptcy and under a criminal investigation, all stemming from the cover-up of sexual abuse in the church. Yeah, but of all the secrets Neinstead is accused of keeping, there's one that's never been revealed until tonight, and it's the secret that's in his own family. Tom Lydon of the Fox 9 Investigators is here with that story. And Tom, this one goes back many years. You know, it goes back a lot of years, that's true. But it foreshadows so much of the church abuse sex scandal that would, that would play out and really is still playing out. More than 40 years ago, a young priest, John Neinstead, knew of an allegation involving one of his friends, another priest. And the victim was a member of Neinstead's own family. What Neinstead did, and more importantly, what he didn't do, fits a pattern that would play out for decades to come. Sunrise along the shores of Lake Huron. This serene setting is where former Archbishop John Neinstead spends his days now, far from the controversies he left behind. It's where we found him out for his brisk morning walk. Good morning, Father. Good morning. How are you doing? Tom Lydon from Channel 9 in Minneapolis. We've come to ask him not just about the secrets of the church. I'm wondering why you didn't do more back in 1973. But the secret that lingers in his own family. Please turn that off. No. Well, I'm going to do that. OK, we'll go with you. The Fox 9 investigators have come here to Detroit, where John Neinstead was born and raised, where he spent much of his career climbing the church hierarchy. We are here to talk to a clergy abuse survivor, a man the former archbishop knows well, because he's a member of his family. Oh, my God. He was the Pope. He was the Pope? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, they looked up to him like, no, you know, there's no tomorrow. Mike Hinsky is from a family of devout Catholics. His mother, a former Dominican nun, is John Neinstead's cousin. In 1974, Neinstead had just been ordained as a priest at a nearby parish outside Detroit and became a frequent guest for Sunday dinners and spent Christmas with the family. He was very close to my parents, and he would bring over other priests, and my parents would entertain them, take them to dinner, and buy them clothes. You know, I mean, they were very generous with the priests. I think my parents were that old belief that that was their gateway to heaven. One of those priests Neinstead brought over was a friend from college, Father Samuel Ritchie, who showed an enthusiastic interest in Mike, who was only 16 at the time. On one particular night, Father Ritchie asked Mike to give him a ride to a Catholic retreat, inviting Mike back to his room and turning off the lights. He said to me, you know, I like you, Mike. And I said, I like you too, Sam. You're a nice guy. He says, no, I really, I love you. And then he starts to undo my shirt. And I remember a couple times saying, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable. You know, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, I have a girlfriend. And when he got to my pants and my pants, and I said, you know, I don't want to do this. He did molest me beyond the shadow of a doubt. On the drive home, Hinsky says Father Ritchie made what sounded to him like a stunning admission. Mike wasn't the only one. I said to him, you know, how many other kids do you do this with? Do you know, are there? And his exact words to me, I'll never forget it, because it stuck with me, is there are several, I have several special friends that come from my parish. And when he said that to me, I knew that he was Kids, it was kids that he was, you know, abusing. Hinsky says that night he told his parents Father Richie molested him and told his sister Mary Beth a few days later. His mother said she tried to tell Neinstead, who was in Rome at the time, but the two didn't discuss it until Neinstead returned home to Michigan. Mike never spoke to Neinstead directly about what happened, but says he suddenly felt invisible. He never once even said, Mike, can I talk to you? Would you mind if I talk to you? He never came near me. I was like the plague to him. He never came near me. The next year, Father Samuel Ritchie moved to Columbus, Ohio, where he taught at several Catholic schools until his past finally caught up with him. The Diocese of Columbus tells the Fox 9 investigators in 2005, it received a credible allegation of abuse against Father Ritchie from 1977 three years after Hinsky says he was molested. The case was too old to prosecute. Same for a second allegation from 1978, a third from 1975. All involved groping or molesting teenage boys. Ritchie was removed from the priesthood six years ago, his teaching certificate revoked. 
Hinsky believes all that could have been avoided if Neinstead had simply listened to him. I specifically begged my parents to let me talk to them because I had to tell them about those several special kids. There's this letter that you wrote to Mike back in 2007. Nine years ago, shortly after he became Archbishop, Neinstead wrote this letter to Hinsky on official letterhead marked personal. Neinstead writes he had lunch with Mike's mother while on vacation in Michigan, and she indicated to me that you are angry with me over my lack of response to the situation that you faced with Sam Ritchie some years ago. Neinstead says Mike's anger is misplaced and writes, in point of fact, you never came to me to seek my assistance. Neinstead doesn't mention that Mike was only 16 at the time. Mike strikes me as a, uh, as a pretty broken man. I'm wondering why you didn't do more back in 1973. Well, I'm, I don't like having this conversation while I'm doing my exercise. Uh, okay. I was in Rome at the time and only learned about it secondhand, so I've actually never discussed this with Michael. In the letter, Neinstead says he only learned what happened from Mike's mother and sister Mary Beth. I assumed from their remarks that you did not want to pursue any legal or ecclesial recourse. Was I supposed to go to the church authorities against your will? I didn't think that appropriate. How would he know if I wanted what I wanted to do? He never talked to me. He never came up to me and said, what happened? What do you want me to do about this? I told him what I wanted him to do. Get that man away from the kids. Why didn't you alert the authorities? Why didn't you tell them, listen, there's an allegation that Father Ritchie molested my cousin? Well, number one, I wasn't told that he had been molested him. So there wasn't an allegation. To well, then what did you approach Father Ritchie about? I asked him if he had proposition, which is a different thing. Than well, he groped him. No, that's not what I, I was told. What exactly Neinstead was told, we'll never know. Mike's mother, the former nun, died six years ago. But Mike's sister, Mary Beth, who was with her brother for our interview, says Mike's story hasn't changed in 43 years and says she never told Neinstead Mike didn't want to talk about it. In fact, what's striking about Neinstead's letter is how vague it is. Never mentioning the proposition of a 16-year-old by a celibate priest, only describing what happened as a situation, an incident, or a case of he said, she said. Neinstead writes they did confront Father Ritchie all those years ago. He led me to believe you had completely misconstrued his words and had sensationalized them. At the time, I had no indication that Sam had such proclivities. Mike Kinski claims that you um, sexually molested him. And that's a story Sam Ritchie's sticking with when I reached him in Ohio. Okay, just to be clear, because it's important, you said you put your hand on his back, but you never touched his lap or his genitals or anything like that. So in your opinion, this was all a misunderstanding? You think so? Richie confirms Neinstead talked to him in 1973, but said Neinstead didn't treat it like a big issue. Why didn't you alert anyone else about this? Why did you just take Father Richie at his word? And by the way, why didn't you talk to Mike about it? Why didn't you say, hey, Mike, what happened with Father Richie? I didn't, I didn't see Michael at the time. Why do you think John Neinstead didn't do more? I think John was just strictly interested in his career. John, John wanted to go up the ladder. When Neinstead returned from Rome, he became secretary to Cardinal John Dearden. Within 10 years, he'd be in charge of Sacred Heart, a major seminary in Detroit. By 2001, he was Bishop of New Ulm. Neinstead was on the fast track. I did what I thought I needed to do at the time. And that's all you did what you needed to do at the time. What does that mean, Father? What does that mean you did what you needed to do at the time? I tried to give, I tried to uh, talk to my family about the situation and to get to the truth of the, the matter. 
The question is, what did Neinstead know, and how hard did he try to find the truth? The same questions that would plague him four decades later and lead to his resignation as archbishop. A kind of blind faith that now echoes through criminal charges and more than 400 civil claims of sex abuse against the archdiocese, including the case of Father Curtis Waymeyer, who cruised parks and bookstores for sex and was treated for sex addiction. According to those charges, Waymeyer asked Archbishop Neinstead a couple times, are you aware of my past? Are you aware of my record? Prosecutors say the Archbishop brushed it off and said, I don't have to look into that stuff. Waymeyer is now in prison after he went on to sexually abuse two boys. We could talk about this some other time. Well, when would you like to talk about it? We could talk to my, my lawyer. Last week, Neinstead changed his mind, sending us this email, repeating that he thought Father Ritchie had only said something inappropriate and placed his hand on Mike's knee, that he was told Mike didn't want to discuss it. He offers only this concession. Knowing more now than what I knew then, I can understand how my letter to my cousin's son could have been and should have been more compassionate. Today, John Neinstead lives just a few miles from Mike Kinski. But the secret has kept these cousins continents apart. Hinsky says it should be no surprise Neinstead couldn't protect children in the church when so long ago he didn't protect the children in his own family. And yet it's Mike Hinsky who lives with the guilt. I felt like I should have done something. I feel like I feel like I owe everybody an apology, you know, because I knew what I knew what he was doing and I I tried. Mike Kinski says there are two words no one has ever said to him in more than 40 years. I'm sorry, not the church and not John Neinstead. The Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis says it was completely unaware of this case until we shared Neinstead's 2007 letter with them just a couple weeks ago. The Archdiocese has since forwarded that letter to police in Detroit. But guys, there is no legal recourse for him. The criminal statute of limitations long ago expired, and Michigan does not have a law like Minnesota does that allows you to go back and civilly go after those cases from so long ago. Tough, tough story. Now, was Neinstead under any legal obligation back in 1974 to report this to Michigan authorities? It's an interesting question. You know, they have a so-called mandatory reporter law in Michigan that requires people to report sex abuse as a member of a clergy. He was, uh, he was under an obligation to do that. It really becomes a question of what exactly did he know? But interestingly enough, under canon law, he was under an obligation to re report it under church law, even if it was a proposition. He was still under an obligation. Mm. Tom, what, what's the latest on the criminal investigation and the internal investigation? That's awfully interesting. The criminal investigation continues. It's in the hands of the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. They've had it for months. No action yet on that. Uh, we have learned it does focus on John Neinstead as an individual along with senior members of the church hierarchy. As far as the internal investigation that the church has been running, no word on that. They can't tell us where that stands. We know two law firms have been involved in that. Unclear whether that will ever be made public, that internal church investigation. Mm, fascinating. Right. Thank you, Tom. Great job.